Hey, all right, so we are, now I want to reiterate one thing that Mr. Fair said, okay, just so we're all clear about this, because uh, a couple weeks ago I gave, a, I gave a lecture on the French and Indian War, and one of the things I mentioned in my lecture was it was really the, you know, the, the fight for beaver pelts that, um, that kind of catapulted the, the uh, French coming in from Canada and, and created a conflict. And then I got a bunch of emails after that saying, hey, I can't find the animal you're talking about. Okay, that's because people just didn't kind of listen to what I was saying. So I get really nervous when I don't see people on video that you're actually listening to what I'm saying. So I feel like I'm gonna have to return. I feel like I'm gonna have about uh, 100 emails uh, about some of these questions that are on here because like I said before these answers are like Mr. Fair said these answers aren't necessarily in the reading and they're not necessarily in the slideshow the, the only way you're gonna get some of these answers is by listening to what I have to say all right so with all of that being said let's kind of move on here so what we're going to talk about here today is the events of um, kind of leading to the Revolutionary War um, Mr. Fair can you want to get the video going? Um, the events leading to the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, now, we've kind of talked about this. We've front-loaded a lot of this information. Um, but what we're trying to get across to you here is not just what happens during these acts. What we're trying to get across to you is kind of this divide that's going to occur between the colonists and the crown. Okay? So... Uh, so, you know, we, we kind of started back in 1763 talking about the proclamation of 1763 and how that really kind of was the end to salutary neglect and how, you know, that was the kind of, you know, the beginning of the crown kind of eh, dictating to the colonists some things. And, and we move into 1764 and 17, well, 1764 with the Sugar Act creates a monopoly, says that, um, that the colonies can only uh, purchase uh, molasses or, or sugar from uh, uh, from British other British colonies. The Currency Act, which dumped a lot of British money into uh, into circulation and created inflation. Uh, the Quartering Act, which was a, a kind of a, a cost saving measure by the Crown. Uh, they just tried to find a way that uh, they could have soldiers in the colonies and yet not pay for them at the same time. So we know all about that. The Stamp Act. You know, this is where the colonists started to say, hey, why are we paying these taxes, yet we have no representation in Congress? All right. And then the Townsend Acts. Uh, so the British government, um, I'm going to ask you a question here, just see if you remember this, because we're not actually going to talk about what the Townsend Acts tax. So if you remember, go ahead and, this is a review for everybody, why don't you go ahead and stick that in the chat there. What did the Townsend Acts actually tax. But I will tell you that the money that went towards uh, those goods, those tax goods, uh, went to pay the uh, government officials' salaries. Now, this is kind of a big difference here because usually those salaries were paid uh, by the colonists themselves. Or, and so then you have uh, kind of the British officials answering to the colonists. Well, now their salary is getting paid through uh, by the British government and so this is just another measure uh, for another way for the British government to try to control what was going on in the colonies and of course the, the writs of assistance also um, were written into the towns and acts and those are basically just kind of open-ended uh, search warrants and they were designed to uh, kind of crack down on, on smuggling. We'll talk more about that when we get to the uh, Fourth Amendment. All right let's see what we got here. Uh, what products did the Townsend Acts tax? We got tea, glass, tea was one of them, glass, yes. Sugar, not nice sugar, Jamie. Mr. Fair, you wanna jump in? Got lead, I don't think they put lead, glass, which one's the yeah, one's the glass. Uh, what are these little ones here? Ink and paper. The essentials, many of the, many of the essentials. Right? All right, so this pushes us, in, so we start to see in the 1760s a divide happening between, uh, you know, the, the colonists starting to get a little bit more upset with the crown. And then something happens early into the 1770, March 5th of 1770 to be exact. Now, just to kind of set the stage for you, 
Um, early on in January and February of 1770, um, there are actually physical conflicts that happen between some of the colonists. Some of those that are more irritated with what the crown is doing and the loyalists, those loyal to the crown. Um, and even some British soldiers, matter of fact. Matter of fact, there was even a death in February of 1770 that resulted from a conflict between loyalists and patriots. Um, but nothing, nothing compared to what happened on March 5th. On March 5th, it was a cool night, and a British guard, a guy by the name of Hugh White, was standing guard outside of a British customs house. Now, a customs house is kind of a storage area, basically is what it is, and it, it was holding a lot of the king's money that was collected by taxes that day. And uh, Hugh White, Private White, was standing guard when a, a, a colonial uh, colonist comes up to him and kind of starts harassing him, uh, calling him names, and, and you know, this was something that was, was done on occasions, especially more recently into 1770. Well, the colonists became a little bit more agitated, a little bit more physical, and Private White, fearing for his own safety, ended up taking the butt of his rifle and hitting the man with it. Well, this attracted the attention, attention of other colonists, and other colonists soon arrived and they began to throw snowballs and, and rocks, and, and then more colonists joined in. And it started to, get, uh, started to get rather raucous. Well, there was a loyalist that was there, and he saw and he feared for um, and the actual life of, of Hugh White. And so uh, this loyalist ran to the guardhouse, and he alerted Captain Preston, the ranking officer at the guardhouse, and Captain Preston uh, took six men, and he went down to where uh, Private White was stationed. Now, this did not quell the crowd whatsoever. Really what this did was it made them more agitated. And they began to, you know, they continued to throw things, and, uh, and, and not only did they throw rocks and, and ice, but also as more and more of the men uh, were coming up from the docks, they were carrying their clubs with them. Now these clubs, um, a lot of these workers worked making ropes, big ropes for ships. And one of the things you have to do with ropes to make sure they're good and tight is you have to beat them out. And they would have these big clubs that were designed, they kind of curved at the end, they were designed uh, to beat these ropes out. And, and a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the crowd had those clubs. They could also be used for weapons obviously. So the crowd is getting up into the 50 or 60 person range. And Captain Preston is, he is doing his best to try to disperse the crowd, trying to calm everything. And some of the, some of the crowd was asking him um, if he could just disband, if he could just um, leave, if it, you know, that would, that would make everything better. Um, because they wanted to see things settle down. Others in the crowd though were inciting uh, more of the crowd members. And they were, they were trying to push those, um, those soldiers. They were yelling things like, fire, like shoot us. And at the same time, you have these church bells that started going off. It was a really, really chaotic scene. All the screaming and yelling, Captain Preston trying to tell his men to settle down, these church bells going off. And then, And then apparently somebody shot a 22. <laughs> right. And then a gun goes off. It was actually Hugh Montgomery um, whose gun goes off. Now, what happened? Did, did he mistakenly hear and think he heard Captain Preston yell fire? Um, and that's why he shot? Did he get hit with a chunk of ice and, and drop his gun and it went off? Did uh, maybe... Um, did it hit his hand and, his, and, and he pulled the trigger and went off? Nobody really knows what happened. But Hugh Montgomery's gun goes off. And then soon after, soon after that, Matthew Kilroy, Private Matthew Kilroy's gun goes off. And then after that, the rest of the soldiers begin to fire. Well, after the smoke clears, five colonists are dead. And then both sides begin with their propaganda machine. Propaganda. So the British 
come out and they interview soldiers and obviously Captain Preston and, um, and they get their account and they publish their account in London newspapers um, under the title, listen to this, The Unhappy Disturbance at Boston. Huh. How quaint. The Unhappy Disturbance at Boston. The colonists had you know, a much different take on it. And the stories that were published in the Boston newspapers took on titles more like The Horrid Massacre in Boston. The Horrid Massacre in Boston. As a matter of fact, and, and Mr. Ferry talked about this too, this is what was published in Boston newspapers. You can see up on the top where it says the Bloody Massacre. Now this is actually, you know, widely attributed to, uh, to Paul Revere. Actually, a guy by the name of Henry Pelham uh, created this, this image and um, Paul Revere um, used the image and maybe that's why he, uh, Paul Revere gets, gets more credit for it. I don't know what it is. But actually, a little bit of trivia, a little bit of history trivia for you. All right, you were on Jeopardy, there you go. Um, but anyway, you can see that uh, this is the kind of thing that was, um, that was put out uh, and a piece of propaganda that was used by the colonists. Mr. Fair talked all about this uh, just a couple of days ago, so I'm not going to go and I'm not going to revisit this. Seven months later, the trial happens. The trial of the eight soldiers for murder. And there are many that come up as witnesses and, and testify that, that Captain Preston did indeed order his men to fire. They say that mercilessly he ordered his men to fire. The bloodthirsty Captain Preston. Well, now you have to understand, there's a guy by the name of John Adams that is defending Captain Preston. Anybody ever heard of John Adams? All right, second president of the United States? Good, all right, good. Um, and he, you know, he looks at these accusations, he's heard these accusations for months and months, almost from, you know, from the get-go. And it, it's really these accusations that he wants to um, defend these soldiers against. And who knows? You know, a lot of people have speculated as to why John Adams actually took this case. Some people say it was because um, he was trying to climb a little bit higher in, in you know, um, in, in British government, um, and this would really get the eye of the, you know, uh, of some of the um, upper echelon. Uh, some people said that they, he was, like, really wanted to counteract what his cousin Sam Adams was doing. Uh, Sam Adams was an agitator with this, the Sons of Liberty. I guess myself, I, I just want to think that he did it because it was really the right thing to do because nobody would really defend these, these soldiers. And so he kind of took up that torch. And he said, you know, really the last thing that any man um, deserves is a, is a good and, and vehement um, defense. So maybe it was because he was trying to prove something to England too. Because, you know, England kind of looked down their nose at the American colonies. And maybe he wanted to prove that, you know, Boston, where he grew up, was actually a civilized society that lived by law and order. And he figured, maybe if I could just, if we could, if we could try these soldiers and they get a fair trial, maybe the powers that be in England can recognize that, that we are a fair society. Whatever the reason, John Adams is, is defending them and, and has to defend them uh, against these, this plethora, this mob of, of patriots that come up and, and testify that they heard Preston give the orders to fire. But you know, Adams, Adams uses good old fashioned forensics, a little CSI stuff. And he calls this one witness to the stand, this guy by the name of Richard Palms. And he asked Richard Palms, he said, did you have, you know, occasion to talk to Captain Preston. He's like, as a matter of fact, I was talking to him when the first shots were fired. And John Adams said, well, that's curious because how did you get behind these soldiers? He figured these, you know, these are trained soldiers and they're not going to let anybody that's even remotely perceived as an enemy to get behind them or try to flank them. And Richard Palm said, oh, I was standing in front of these soldiers. 
And so John Adams says, okay, if you were standing in front and you were talking to Captain Preston, where was Captain Preston standing? And Richard Palm said, well, Captain Preston was standing in front of his men as well. And so then John Adams asked, he said, did you, since you were standing right next to Captain Preston, did you hear him give the command to fire? And Richard Palm says, that would be ridiculous. Why would Captain Preston standing in front of his men, in front of the guns, why would he give the, why would he give the order to fire? Then John Adams, furthermore, he looked at uh, Richard Palm's jacket. He said, is this the jacket you were wearing on that day? And he said, yes. And he pointed out that there were gunpowder burns on this jacket, proving that Richard Palm's was, in fact, quite near some of the guns that had, had gone off. And it was this evidence, this idea that that Palms was talking to Preston, who was indeed standing in front of his men, and no man, no captain would ever give the order to fire standing in front of his men, that really got Captain Preston off. So Captain Preston was found not guilty. Um, in a separate trial, the five, five of the other soldiers were also found not guilty. So, so if you do some math here, you have Captain Preston and then five other soldiers. Okay, and you might have caught me say, you might have heard me say before that there was actually eight soldiers involved in this. Um, the two soldiers that fired first, Private Hugh Montgomery and Private Matthew Kilroy, were actually found guilty of manslaughter. Now, there's several degrees to murder, and we don't need to get into what manslaughter is, but it's it's causing the death of somebody else. Let's just leave it at that. And you know, if, if you ask a lawyer, they would probably give you a you know, a good two-hour dissertation on what manslaughter is, but we'll just say it's causing the death of somebody else. And this is something where they could have been actually found guilty of and, 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 and sentenced to death. However, in their sentencing, what they got was really a branding between the thumb and the forefinger of an M to indicate that they were murderers. And then they were released back to England. That was really kind of what happened um, in Boston on March 5th of 1770. Um, now, okay, Mr. Ferry, you ready to walk him through the uh, journal question? Yep. All right. All right. All right. Hang on for a second. There you go. Thank you. Okay, try now. Okay. Uh, so the question 